Good afternoon. It's Thursday, September 17th. I'm Laura Cornfield, and this is IBA News, broadcasting from Jerusalem. Relative calm was restored to Jerusalem's old city today, following four days of violence between Palestinian protesters and security forces. Police presence in and around the area was beefed up. Dozens of members of the Likud's party youth movement gathered this morning at the Temple Mount compound, just hours after police arrested at least eight Palestinian protesters suspected of involvement in the recent unrest at the site. Members of the Likud movement said their planned visit was aimed to assert Israeli sovereignty over the compound, even though the Prime Minister's office had reportedly tried to persuade them from ascending to the Temple Mount. Their visit went without incident. While the violent confrontations which began this week at the start of the Rosh Hashanah holiday had mostly faded, forces in the area will remain on high alert ahead of the upcoming Yom Kippur holiday next week. Palestinian sources are reporting that PA President Mahmoud Abbas is planning to drop a so-called diplomatic bombshell when he addresses the United Nations General Assembly at the end of the month. Abbas reportedly uh, told the daily Al-Quds al-Arabi that he plans to retire soon, but he didn't elaborate. Meanwhile, Abbas was more outspoken yesterday when he addressed a group of East Jerusalem residents about the latest violence in Jerusalem. The PA president said the Palestinians won't allow Israelis to desecrate Islamic and Christian holy sites. Al-Aqsa is ours and so is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. He added that the Jews have no right to desecrate them with their filthy feet. We won't allow them to do so. Abbas went on to say that each drop of blood that was spilled in Jerusalem is considered pure blood as long as it's for the sake of Allah. Palestinian security prisoner Mohammed Alan has relaunched his hunger strike after he was rearrested yesterday. Alan, who was discharged from the Barzillai Medical Center in Ashkelon, where he had been receiving treatment, was returned to the custody of the Israel Prison Service and immediately resumed his protest against his detention without the filing of criminal charges. The 31-year-old suspected Islamic jihadist terrorist was released from administrative detention last month after refusing food for over 60 days. His brother today told Army Radio that Alan is prepared to die for the sake of this protest. He said he told him that he will refuse to eat, drink, speak or receive medical treatment unless he is once again released from administrative detention. In late August, the High Court of Justice ordered the hunger strikers release due to his deteriorating medical condition and the suspicion that he suffered brain damage. The release order allowed Alan's family to visit him freely while undergoing medical treatment and suspended his administrative detention. The IDF today deployed an Iron Dome battery in the Ashdod area amid fears of renewed rocket fire into Israel from Gaza. The move was made as part of preparations for a potential escalation of tensions in connection to Alan's condition and concern that he may die. The Army's Southern Command confirmed that Alan's arrest was behind the decision to deploy the anti-missile defense system, but stressed it was a preemptive measure and that rocket fire was not anticipated. Now it's official. Following months of tension between the two, U.S. President Barack Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu will meet in Washington. On November 9th, 2015, we'll host Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu at the White House. The President looks forward to discussing with the Prime Minister regional security issues, including implementation of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action to peacefully and verifiably prevent Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon and countering Tehran's destabilizing activities in the region. The November meeting will be the first for the two leaders since U.S.-led diplomacy resulted in the Iranian nuclear deal that Israel fiercely opposes. Dispute over the agreement drove an even deeper wedge in the already strained relations between Washington and Jerusalem. In March, Obama refused to meet Netanyahu when the premier accepted an invitation from Republican leaders without consulting the White House and gave a speech to Congress in which he harshly criticized Obama's negotiations with Iran. The two have since spoken by telephone, but haven't seen each other face to face since last year. However, the White House has reiterated the Obama administration's commitment to Israel's security and advancing strategic cooperation between the two countries. The President also looks forward to discussing Israel's relations with the Palestinians, the situation in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, and the need for the genuine advancement of a two-state solution. 
Prime Minister Netanyahu's visit to the United States is a deep demonstration of the deep and enduring bonds between the United States and Israel, as well as our unprecedented cooperation to further enhance Israel's security. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has previously described the level of security cooperation that's been offered by the Obama administration as unprecedented. Uh, that, I think, is an indication of the President's personal commitment to the security of Israel and to the unshakable bond between our two countries. The President has, for some time, indicated a, a not just a willingness but a desire uh, to engage in, con uh, in, uh, in conversations about how we could further deepen that security cooperation. Um, there was some reticence on the part of the Israelis initially in, uh, to engage in those discussions. Uh, but we uh, would expect in the context of uh, this meeting in November and uh, others that may be on the, the agenda for uh, low, lower level officials uh, to begin having those discussions. Joining me now from our Tel Aviv studio to discuss the latest tensions surrounding the capital is Jerusalem Affairs expert Professor Moshe Amirav of Hebrew University. Professor Amirav, thank you so much for coming in. Hi. Israel's response to the Palestinian violence in Jerusalem has sparked condemnation across the Arab world and the international community. What is it they expect us to do, and why is this so volatile? Uh, nothing new. We have a very short memory when it comes to history of the conflict between us and the Palestinians, even in the 30s. The main question between us and the Palestinians that raised attention of the whole Muslim world was Temple Mount. The Palestinians were always, especially their leader Hussein at that time, clever enough to understand that if they want the support of the world, the Muslim world, against the Zionist movement, they have to raise the question of Temple Mount and the Wailing Wall. And they did it very successfully, and until now they are doing it very successfully. This is a very sensitive issue uh, between the Palestinians and the Arab world, the Muslim world, and whenever Israel is falling into the same trap of uh, having riots on the mountain, it goes against us, Israel. It will always be in favor of the Palestinians. Professor, are these actions considered a violation of the sanctity of the Temple Mount site? I, I couldn't hear you. Sorry. Are these actions considered a violation of the sanctity of the Temple Mount site? Yeah. The, uh, the situation in uh, Temple Mount is very uh, strange. I mean, on one hand, uh, we say we have sovereignty in Jerusalem. Actually, no country in the world agrees or recognizes our sovereignty in Jerusalem. Israel says that we have sovereignty over Temple Mount, but actually there is no flag, no Israeli flag, and uh, the Israeli administration, including the army, is not there unless there are riots. So I think the government has to decide what is the special status we Israelis are ready to give to this temple. If you would ask me, I was in uh, Camp David with uh, Prime Minister Barak when we were dealing uh, with the Palestinians trying to find a solution. We couldn't find a solution because of Temple Mount. Temple Mount is such a sensitive issue, such a, um, I would say, explosive one, that uh, the only way I can see for a solution is that we will come to a kind of agreement, not only with the Palestinians, also with the Islamic world, about how this place, which is so holy for them, very sensitive for us too, how it will be managed, not only by the Palestinians, but kind of a committee, an international committee, that we deal not only with the riots, but also with the excavations, that uh, this is uh, something they are doing, and we Israelis, we can't do anything about it. So it's a kind of a... West, uh, wild west there, and uh, I think the Israeli government is falling again and again the last hundred years into this uh, trap, which is Temple Mount as an issue for the Palestinians, in which always, always there will be the right one in this conflict in the eyes of the Muslim world and also in the West. What do you make of Palestinian President Abbas's remarks that Palestinians won't allow Israelis to desecrate Islamic and Christian holy sites with their, quote, filthy feet? I think uh, the holy sites, or I would say the whole idea of the old city as a place which has uh, this uh, kind of importance to Muslims, Christians, Jews, should be in the future in a kind of a very special arrangement. We were speaking about it in Camp David 2000, that this would be a kind of a status to Temple Mount, 
which will be special. We couldn't agree on what kind of special status will it be. But definitely, if we want to have a kind of arrangement in Temple Mount, we won't solve the problem of Jerusalem. If we don't solve the problem of Jerusalem, we won't solve the problem between us and the Palestinians. Professor Amirav, do you think the violence is actually the result of the lack of a diplomatic process? Definitely. I mean, if there was a diplomatic uh, process, if uh, the Palestinians would sit with us to the table, which they don't do it, uh, it would be much more easier uh, also to have this tension that is, will always be around Temple Mount. The fact that we don't have a political process will bring more and more violence around the Temple Mount. And it's up to us. We are the strong one. We are holding the place. We, we are ruling the West Bank and Jerusalem. It's up to us to initiate new ideas and arrangements with the Palestinians, but not only with them, also with Jordan and the Islamic world, to find a kind of a solution to Temple Mount. It's different from all the other issues we deal with the Palestinians. It's much more important than water security, border settlements. These are the main issues we are dealing with them. But Temple Mount is a very unique question. It will always be full with this tension. So I suggest the government, if I can suggest anything to this government, is to start with Temple Mount. It will not be the last one on the agenda. It has to be the first one. And we have to take in order to find the solution, we need the Arab world, we need uh, King Abdullah from Jordan, we need the Muslim world, and uh, of course the United Nations. Alone, we can't do anything but stand there and see how this uh, each uh, two, three, four months, we have another riot uh, on the Temple Mount. Professor Moshe Amirav, thank you so much for coming in and being our guest this evening. Thank you. Israeli-made products will be banned in Iceland's capital. That was a decision passed by Reykjavik's city council. Members of the board said that the boycott was a symbolic act demonstrating the Icelandic capital's support for Palestinian statehood and condemnation of what they termed Israel's policy of apartheid. According to the motion, the city will boycott Israeli goods as long as the occupation of Palestinian territories continues. The measure makes no distinction between products made inside pre-1967 Israel or beyond the Green Line. The foreign ministry in Jerusalem had harsh words for the decision, calling it a volcano of hate exploding in Reykjavik's city council building. A local lawyer in Reykjavik reportedly said he may appeal the move on the grounds that it violates the Icelandic constitution. Israel's settlement policies have nothing to do with ongoing attempts to boycott and delegitimize the Jewish state. That's the view of former Deputy Foreign Minister Danny Ayalon, who told IBA's Efrat Batat that international BDS actions will eventually backfire at the Palestinians. The most obvious thing mm -hmm. to stop, let's say, BDS and delegitimizations is to stop being a Jewish state, mm -hmm. uh, to stop defending ourselves, uh, to stop uh, building in the territories. Hopefully that will stop it. I'm not sure, because then they would find some other arguments. I think the BDS is mostly anti-Semitic motivated, since it's not politically correct to be anti-Jewish now or anti-Semitic, certainly after uh, the Holocaust, then being anti-Israel now or anti-Zionist replaces anti-Semitism. So I think that um, we must continue defend ourselves, must continue to serve our national interests, but at the same time show the other side, show compassion to the Palestinians, show that we are ready for far-reaching um, concessions if we do have a partner which is uh, truthful, which is uh, uh, trustworthy, which really wants peace. And, uh, and this is what we need to show. The settlements are not the crux of the matter, as they were not in Gaza mm -hmm. when we evacuated all of them. Uh, terrorism against Israel, delegitimization of Israel started way before the first settlement was in Judea and Samaria. So there are many, many ways to, to tackle it. And of course, also the political matters that uh, BDS is, uh, is not ethical, it's not moral, it uh, doesn't make any sense politically or economically. And it could, at the end of the day, harm the Palestinians more, uh, more than us. And uh, especially especially we are now doing a project of by comparative analysis we say why do you boycott why do you zero on israel i mean their occupations 
in Chechnya and in the Ukraine and Crimea, uh, let alone in, in other places where we don't hear about. Uh, so I think we have to put things into perspective with the right proportions. There is a way to do it. Again, it's not going to be, it's, there is not a quick fix, but we have to keep at it until we gain one viewer at a time, one organization at a time. And at the end of the day, I think we can level the playing fields. And this is what the truth about Israel is about, leveling the playing fields of uh, uh, the political arena uh, for Israel. Turning to the U.S., where Republican presidential candidates held their second debate last night, the 11 presidential hopefuls lambasted Obama and sparred over foreign policy, especially the future of the nuclear deal with Iran and the legacy of the war in Iraq. Lining up in the Regan Library Air Force Pavilion in Washington, D.C., the group debated for nearly three hours, much of which they went at each other with personal attacks. However, one thing was clear, they were united in their support for Israel. You have not heard a plan about Iran from any politician up here. Here's my plan. On day one in the Oval Office, I will make two phone calls. The first to my good friend Bibi Netanyahu to reassure him we will stand with the state of Israel. The second to the Supreme Leader to tell him that unless and until he opens every military and every nuclear facility to real anytime, anywhere inspections by our people, not his, we, the United States of America, will make it as difficult as possible to move money around the global financial system. We can do that. We don't need anyone's cooperation operation to do it. And every ally and every adversary we have in this world will know that the United States of America is back in the leadership business. How do we confront Iran? And the first thing that we need to do is to reestablish our commitment to Israel, which has been tattered by this administration, and make sure that they have the most sophisticated weapons to send a signal to Iran that we have Israel's back. If we do that, it's going to create a healthier deterrent effect than anything else I can think of. This threatens Israel immediately. This threatens the entire Middle East, but it threatens the United States of America. And we can't treat a nuclear Iranian government as if it is just some government that would like to have some power. This is a government that for 36 years has killed Americans. They kidnapped Americans. They've maimed Americans. They have sponsored terrorist groups, Hamas and Hezbollah. And they threaten the very essence of Western civilization. In more local news, a Batyam resident was arrested this morning on suspicion of murdering his wife overnight. He has confessed and reenacted the incident this afternoon. The 37-year-old man phoned the police and told them that he killed his 31-year-old wife. He waited next to her body until they arrived. The couple's four and 10-year-old sons were in the apartment at the time of the murder and have been put in the care of the welfare services. According to police officials, the suspect had undergone drug rehabilitation. There was no previous record of domestic violence, and the couple was not known to authorities. A new train line connecting the southern coastal city of Ashkelon and Beersheba was inaugurated today in the presence of Prime Minister Netanyahu and Transportation Minister Yisrael Katz. The Negev Railway is a double 70-kilometer track connecting the two southern cities with stops along the way in Sterot and Itivot. In about two months, the line will make an additional stop at Ofakim. The two billion shekel train line will be operating daily with about 25 trains running in each direction. Residents of the southern town have reportedly said that they will not be so quick to take advantage of the new train service because it is more than twice the cost of the bus. In response, the Transportation Ministry has announced that residents of Sterot, Nitivot, Ofakim, and the surrounding communities will get a 50% discount on their railway commute for the next two years with the aim of getting reluctant passengers back on track. Turning abroad, a major earthquake has rocked Chile. Measuring 8.3 on the Richter scale, the quake struck along the Chilean coast. Over one million people were evacuated from their homes along the Pacific Ocean in anticipation of enormous tsunami waves. At least five people were killed when powerful waves hit a coastal town where the quake caused some damage and downed power lines. The quake shook buildings in the capital of Santiago and was felt as far away as Buenos Aires, Argentina. It was the largest earthquake worldwide this year. Tsunami advisories were also issued for Hawaii, French Polynesia, and California. In financial news, the shekel was mixed against all major foreign currencies. While share prices on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange were down in end-of-week trading, here's a look at the late afternoon numbers.
Turning to the forecast, a no change in temperatures is predicted tomorrow. Here are the highs and lows for the next 24 hours at home and abroad. And that's all for this newscast. Aaron Viner will be here tomorrow with more news from Israel and abroad. Until then, I'm Laura Cornfield wishing you a great weekend and shalom from Jerusalem.